Hey, in this segment, we're going to talk about principles for interpreting God's Word. Another term for it is hermeneutics. And um, flowing from our discussion last time of the inerrancy of God's Word, I thought it would be appropriate to ask, well, how do we understand or study God's Word? Are there any basic rules for helping me to interpret and to understand it correctly? And the answer is yes, there are. And my passion is to help people to get into God's Word, get passionate about it, and to um, read it for themselves. And I think that some people have been hesitant to, hesitant to do that because they, I don't know, for various reasons, haven't felt equipped or um, other reasons. So I'm hoping that the things I touch on here will equip folks to have the confidence to tackle God's Word, which was meant to be read by everyone and to be understood. So... Just a couple of preliminary comments before I dig in. And um, the first thing I wanted to say is that my emphasis is on how to study God's Word and not just casual reading, because that's what we really want is, is, uh, is to study God's Word. If it's going to have any impact on us, any lasting impact, then there needs to be a... Um, a real application of our whole being in um, our study of it. Now, here are some of the complaints that I've, I've heard from folks regarding the Bible that has that have tripped them up in uh, reading Scripture. The Bible is just too difficult for me to understand, and I need. Don't you have to have, you know, a seminary education to really understand the difficult parts and all that sort of thing? And my answer to that really is that it's, it's not really, it's, it's not, it's really not that difficult to understand. Um, from Genesis to Revelation, it's essentially quite clear. And one of the Traits that we talked about when discussing Scripture was its perspicuity, uh, which is a not very perspicuous name for clarity. Um, but that's really what I'm getting at, is that the Bible is really very clear. And that was God's intention from the very beginning, is that He intended for there to be an ordinary human language clear communication from him to us, his image bearers, whom he loves. And I would say that the newspaper and the blogs that we read are usually harder to read than the Bible. And in most places, Scripture is clear. Um, again, this gets back to the doctrine of the Bible's clarity. I wonder how many Christians have read it from cover to cover, though. Um Probably not too many. But Deuteronomy 6, if you look at that, it talks about, and this is my paraphrase, is that, you know, whether you sit or stand, talk it over with your children uh, about God's Word. And obviously, if you're talking it over with your children, then it assumes that they're going to understand as well. And yes, there's things more... There are some things in Scripture that are more difficult to understand than others, but you do not need to go to seminary or no Greek or Hebrew to, um, to, to understand Scripture. It's, uh, it's written in, in just ordinary language, and it's actually quite easy to understand. It, it is. Uh, Secondly, another complaint I hear is that the Bible is just, I mean, the folks are just honest, they say it's boring. Um, my response is, no, it's not. 
Um, you know, granted, some passages are a little difficult. You know, this just names and lists of people. Uh, I understand that. But even those passages have real meaning if you take the time just to, to understand why those names are there. It means that individuals are important to God. But, you know, there's a, some places in the scripture are obviously more colorful than others. But if you understand what you're reading, that these are the very oracles of God, the very words of God. That is, if Jesus walked into your room right now where you're sitting, what he would say to you would not have any more authority than the words that you would read out of the Bible. Or put it another way, when you pick up your Bible, it is as if Jesus, Paul, God himself, was standing in the room and talking to you. It's God's personal presence and His truth speaking to you. Um, how can that be boring? You know, we don't make... Um, I've heard some people who are really uh, vivacious and, and uh, infectious Bible teachers, they... People have said that they know how to make the Bible come alive. But in, in actuality, the Bible is alive, and it's what makes us come alive. Uh, it has stories that touches on every conceivable emotion. And really, uh, I don't want to sound harsh, but the problem often boils down to motivation, doesn't it? And that's laziness. Just calling a spade a spade. We're, we just, we deal with selfishness and we deal with laziness. And I mean we as in we. Um, that's just part of the, uh, that fallen nature that still, uh, indwelling sin that still remains. And we just have to deal with it and work through it. But if we wait until we're sufficiently motivated before we read, then um, we're going to be very inconsistent in our reading. The, the late R.C. Sproul, one of my real heroes, he spoke of the sensuous Christian. Back in high school, there was a bestseller called The Sensuous Man, Sensuous Woman, Sensuous Couple. And you can imagine what it was all about. Um, but he talked about the sensuous Christian, and if you look at the definition of a sen sensuous, that just has to do with being, um, having to do with feelings. Uh, and sometimes we can be too addicted to our feelings as far as letting how our, our feelings determine whether or not we are motivated to do what we know we should do. And... Many only read the scriptures when they are sufficiently motivated in their feelings. But we need to adopt holy habits. First thing I do when I get up is splash water in my face. I stumble in there, get a cup of coffee, and plop down in my chair. And um, I can say that that's a holy habit that God has helped me to, to have for 45 years. Okay, let's switch gears again, and uh, just one preliminary comment before we get into the actual principles, and this has to do with, um, before we get into the actual things to do, this has to do with our attitude, you know, and I, I consciously think through this when I sit down in my chair, um, we need to when we read God's word, we need to approach our time with the Lord with a deeply humble, prayerful, teachable heart that is willing to be corrected. 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. So, in addition, we need to read with a real sense of anticipation. 
that you will encounter the living word, whether there's bells and whistles and and uh, sensation going up and down your spine, whether that's there or not, it's probably probably won't for most of the time. But that God, as I've said before, His presence is more real than whether or not we have a sensation of his feelings, a feeling that he's there. Um, but in, we need to have that anticipation uh, in, when we're reading that we're going to encounter the living word. Who will read us as we read his word? Hebrews 4.12 He'll, he'll read you as you read him. Um, that's the way it's, it works. And we need to also have the kind of the sense that we will commu commune personally, intensely personally with the incarnate word as we read his inscripturated word. They are, they are both the word and both divine. Where the Word of God, there is God. And where is God, there is the Word. Um, I always ask the Lord to help me to focus, to concentrate, to illumine my mind, to understand, and to rightly apply uh, His Word. All right, now, in one, in one way I could just say, if you want to rightly, rightly interpret Scripture, just take your time and read it carefully. Okay? But here are some specific principles. Alrighty? I'm going to have a printed form of this along with the video. So, principles for correctly interpreting Scripture. The first three are read it, read it, read it. <laughs> and then apply it, apply it, apply it. Um, we can't go if we're not reading uh, God's Word consistently. And um, let's see here. In Hebrews 5 and chapter 6, both say that in order to grow spiritually, we have to uh, both read and apply. And it's called the hermeneutical circle. We read to know what to do, and as we do or obey, then we grow in our understanding of the meaning of the text. And then as we understand more of the meaning of this text, then we understand more of what to do, how to obey God. And then as we do that, then we understand more of the meaning, and this goes deeper and deeper. And that's the whole point. At uh, the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of uh, chapter 6 in Hebrews, is there's, a, um, there's no real understanding of Scripture, real understanding, unless there's obedience uh, connected with it. All right, so uh, principle number one, and the most primary rule which flows out of, uh, well, it was before the Re Reformation, but the, the reformers like Luther and Calvin really brought to for forefront. And that is principle number one in interpretation of hermeneutics is that Scripture interprets Scripture. And it's otherwise known as the analogy of Scripture. That is, if you're reading a text um, and you're, you're perplexed by it, then let the other parts of Scripture interpret Scripture. Uh, this is based on the assumption of inerrancy that we talked about last time, which means that uh, truth is coherent as it's presented, presented in God's Word. And that there's going to be a, a unity and a coherence within um, the 66 books of, of uh, God's Word. And so that the best way to make ensure that we're interpreting it correctly is to compare Scripture with Scripture. If there are two possible interpretations of a text, um, but one accords with what Scripture says elsewhere, then obviously that's the the interpretation to be preferred.
For example, if we're um, perplexed about the meaning of the book of James, as many have <laughs> over the years, um, the thing to do is to uh, interpret James in light of Paul. And folks say, well, they're contradictory. Well, no, the thing to do is to see that it hinges uh, on two definitions of the word justified and um, the object of the justification. Paul is speaking of how we're declared righteous by faith, and James is more concerned with the evidence of the reality of our faith. But we know it would seem on the surface that, that uh, James and um, Paul are contradictory, but we know um, that according to this principle, Scripture interpreting Scripture, that they cannot be, because God's Word is coherent and doesn't contradict itself. All right, uh, principle number two is to ask, what does this word or what does this verse mean um and that doesn't that is the first question we should sh should should ask is not what does it mean to you that comes after discovering the meaning of the the, the text many bible studies are degenerate into sharing circles of what does this text mean to you you know, going around in a circle, and it's kind of, forgive me, but it's kind of a share your ignorance type thing with, uh, without discussing its true meaning or what it says about God and so on. And this can lead to a real subjectivism of the text. Um, by the way, if you come across a truth that you don't like, which happens? If there's something that you read and you instinctively say, oh, that doesn't sound like sound like the God I believe in or whatever, take the time to really look at it because that can be a time of really accelerated growth. Um, you may one of three things are going on. You either misunderstood the text, um, there's a problem with God, or there's a problem with you, and we know there's not a problem with God. So. Uh, there have been several times in my life where I, uh, I've had to embrace some things contrary to my feelings. Um, but then over time, I, I thought, how in the world did I not see the beauty of, of that particular teaching? Um, I struggled real hard with the sovereignty of God when I first um, came across it early on. Principle number three. Read the Bible literally, not literalistically. That is, you know, like wooden literalism. What I mean by literally is read the words of Scripture in the normal sense of words. This is God in His word. In His word. Is communicating to us in ordinary human language so there's a sense in which we should read the Bible as if it was any other book just in this sense all right we know that the primary author is God himself I'm just talking about as far as interpreting the words see in medieval times there were very fanciful allegorical um, means of interpretations uh, which were very common and they just flat out ignored the common sense meaning of the words. Um, I wonder, this is still pretty common today. Um, have, have you ever heard a sermon on what the rocks in David's pouch meant? I'm not kidding. Um, there, there are some preachers who might put some real significance on the rocks being this or that or that sort of thing. Um, but as I said, the Bible is read like any book. The nouns are nouns, verbs are verbs. There's no magic in between the verses. Um, there's no hidden meaning in between the verses. There's no numerical value to counting the text backwards in Greek or anything of that kind of uh, uh, jive. Fourthly, and similarly, 
read it in what is known as a gram grammatical historical sense, and that's just a fancy word for uh, pay attention to the grammar and the history. That's it. Take into account the grammar and the historical background. Sometimes word studies, and please listen to this, okay? Sometimes word studies of the Greek and Hebrew can help, but I'm finding more and more that for the most part, um, you got to be very cautious about that. In fact, I have a link at the bottom. This a very is a superb article on this very topic of the many fallacies that we we commit um, when it comes to word studies and um, how that's common from the pulpit as well as in personal Bible study. Again, word studies can be helpful, but we have to remember that the words are usually, the meanings of, are, are usually determined by usage and context and not by their distant origin or entomology. Okay? And again, please see the link below. Um, take into account the different literary genres. Poetry should be read as poetry, narrative should be read as narrative, parable as parable, um, wisdom literature as, as that. And um, in my own Bible uh, devotion, I'm reading uh, Revelation now, and that's obviously apocalyptic literature, full of symbolism, um, but so many references to the Old Testament. And, and uh, some background uh, is, there is, is helpful. And so most of your Bibles, uh, if you take a few minutes before you start reading, just you know, look at the historical background for why Ephesians was read and so forth, and that will help you uh, with whatever book that you're reading. All right, principle number five. I'm skating over these pretty quick because each one of these I could take a long time on. In fact, Wayne Grudem... He, he did five s different segments. He did. He's the one who did the systematic theology. He did five entire classes, uh, on, um, and I'm going to do all of it in, in one one series. So uh, we're condensing it to put it, let's say it uh, mildly. Number five, and this is crucial too. The text has only one correct meaning but many applications. I'll say it again. The, the biblical text has only one correct meaning, but it can have countless applications. Six, the rule of context. The meaning must be gathered from the context. Every word you read must be understood in light of the words that come before and after it. Again, this is just ordinary language. Many passages will not be understood at all or understood incorrectly without the help afforded by the context. You know, a good example of this is the Mormon practice of human using 1 Corinthians 8, 5. For there, are, uh, for there be God's many and Lord's many as a proof text of their doctrine of polytheism. And they also do the same thing with um, God having a body. However, if they would do compare scripture to scripture and a simple reading of the whole verse in the context of the whole chapter, where Paul calls these gods so-called, plainly, de plainly demonstrates that Paul is not teaching polytheism. And of course, again, scripture um, comparing it with scripture, uh, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is monotheistic to the core. So context would include the verse, chapter, the book, and then the entire Bible. But you usually don't have to go to the entire Bible, but um, very often you can determine the meaning just within the first uh, few verses around it.
to understand what the Holy Spirit's intent is in this context. And that's a question that I ask myself uh, often because I'm reminding myself that it's the Holy Spirit who is the primary author. And so I, I ask myself when I'm reading a text, what is the Holy Spirit's intense intent in this context? And, you know, we can bring our theology very easily, including myself, into a particular verse and read it into it. It's called Jesus. whereas what we want to do is exegesis, and that's pulled out of the text what is there. Seven, read it what I call existentially now this gets back to the boredom issue that i mentioned uh, to overcome our tendencies to be bored at times and yeah i find boredom at, at time, but you know, have to push through it but if we intentionally try to read it existentially and that is put yourself in the shoes of the characters that you're reading and try to feel um, their emotions, um, place yourself in their shoes, their situation, and try to feel their emotions. Just use your imagination. That's, uh, I think, an important part of loving God and understanding His Word is our imagination which is often uh, overlooked in theology, the importance of the imagination. Number eight, historical narrative. This was brought home to me in college powerfully. The historical narrative uh, books must be interpreted by the didactic or teaching books. I'll say that again. The historical narrative or history books in the Old and New Testament, like um, you have 1st, 2nd Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, and so forth, and then you have the Gospels and the Book of Acts. Those are a historical narrative. They, the intent, the explicit intent, is to narrate history of one of like an Old Testament of the kings and so forth, and then a New Testament of the life, uh, the person and the work of the Lord Jesus, and the. Um, but it's exceedingly important that we see, and this is one of the most basic, uh, important principles of interpretation. Um, that is that we interpret the historical narratives by the didactic or the teaching texts. Many folks derive faulty assumptions and beliefs from the events that occurred that may not have been right or meant were only meant for that crucial juncture in redemptive history. There's a few things that the, at the, in the apostolic era that was um, like Pentecost and that, that were non-repeatable. You know, we, we all receive the Holy Spirit for sure, but Jesus died once, obviously, so that, that apostolic era, that's gone. And so, but that's not my point, is that, I'll give an example, is, is the Gospels, um, are interpreted by the epistles, Gospels and Acts. The Gospels are largely reporting of events, like, you know, Jesus is um, exercising of demons, his teaching ministry, his uh, life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. But though there is some teaching in, in the Gospels, the burden of the Gospels is history. That's its intent. But the epistles are largely interpreting these events. That's that's what the epistles' intent 
is. Now, they, they were written, obviously, to deal with specific problems as well. But there's a saying um, that sometimes a word, a group of words, can be worth a thousand pictures. You've heard the phrase, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. Where in this, in this case, sometimes a word can be worth a thousand pictures. Because what Galatians and Romans teach us about the cross is stunning. If you were to stand in front, if you were an eyewitness of Jesus dying on the cross, and you had no idea of the theological significance of what was going on, you would have thought that he was just another um, Jewish man, stripped, bleeding, sweating, in utter agony. And that'd be it. Because all of the real happening, the imputation of sin, uh, the propitiation, that was invisible. So, you know, we need the epistles to interpret the events of the uh, Gospels. We need both. It's not saying one's more important than the other. Is, is what which one it interprets. Um, sometimes asking what Jesus would do is not appropriate <laughs> because he's the Lord of the church, so he can whip folks in the temple, and we can't. You know, think of the story of Jetha, you know, that, that one where he's, he made a, a, a vow to God, says, Lord, if you help me to make, uh, help me to be victorious, I'll offer up to you the first thing that comes out of my tent. And so, lo and behold, he was victorious, came back, and to his chagrin, horror, uh, his daughter came out of the tent. So what did he do? Well, depending on the interpretation, uh, she either remained, um, he, he either killed her, or um, she remained childless um, to, to, till she died. Um, but if you understand the 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 that is in the historical narrative of the Old Testament, but my point is is that um, very often, in fact, most of the time, in the Old Testament narratives of what happens, like with Jephthah, the editor does not comment on the rightness or wrongness of his uh, actions. He's, um, he's assuming that the reader would engage with the text and make that connection. But in Jephthah's case, there's clear scriptural teaching, didactic teaching, which says that you shouldn't make inappropriate wrong vows. And if you do make a wrong vow, then you need to break it. So it was sinful for him to, to have kept that vow. Um, so that's just an example of how the didactics helped us to understand um, the what's going on in the uh, historical narrative. And as I said, often ungodly behavior is reported in the historical narrative without editorial comment because the writer assumes that the reader would engage with the text and make their connection. Um, there's been a lot of um, unsound theology that has been formulated based on what happened in the book of Acts, but is not consistent with the didactic teachings of Scripture. And I'll just make it clear. The idea that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is subsequent to salvation, uh, as is taught in some circles, uh, I'll deal with that later when we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but that's a clear example of how folks do not see the interpretive priority of the epistles over Acts, um, and thus you have a very significant error made. And it is significant because it, it, it puts a um, disjunction or disunity between the body of Christ, two layers of Christians, and, and you know something's wrong when the very uh, 
spirit whose who's one of his main purposes is to cause unity is that if that, that that very teaching causes disunity in the body um, uh, of necessity because of bifurcating it in half between the haves and the haves nots. So, um, number nine, the less clear texts need to be interpreted by the explicit. An example would be 1 Samuel 28 in the medium of Endor. Um, the meaning of that entire text is disputed. Uh, so, no doctrine should be derived from it. But, I know many people who will jump on 1 Samuel 28 and say, this is an earthbound spirit. This is a, this is a trapped human being. Well, it's not in the text anyway. And more importantly, it's refuted in both the Old and New Testament. That is a notion of people being trapped here. That's a notion that's obnoxious to um, the perfection of the atonement and a, a thousand other arguments. Ten, the Old Testament uh, uh, should be interpreted through the lens of the New Testament. Okay, so if you're reading the Old Testament, then you need it, uh, not only may you, but you must read it through the lens of um, the, the New Testament. And perhaps I should, make, should have made this as a separate point, but um, we need to be Christocentric in our reading in both Testaments, but i um, thinking particularly of the Old Testament. Um, when Jesus was on the Emmaus road, road, road to Emmaus, and the, the guy said that their hearts uh, were burning inside of them, and that Christ said that the, the entire Old Testament um, referred to him. So when you're reading the Old Testament, read it Christocentric centrically that everywhere not just predictive prophecy but the history of, of um, God's people the details of the ceremonies um, just across the board um, you can see the um, going back to Genesis 315 um, uh, let's see here so read it Christocentrically um, my first point was reading it just through the lens of the New Testament, but please see Christ. Um, that would be uh, the main point there. But I, I did want to say that as an example of the new and the old, I was reading just this morning of um, God's instructions to Aaron to place seven lampstands in, in the tabernacle. This is in Numbers. And I also read, same day, uh, in Revelation, where Jesus is referred to, um, he refers to, in Revelation 1 and 2, the seven lampstands. Uh, there's an obvious parallel there. And that's, you can see the Christocentric nature of that. Okay? And what I often like to point out is that if you have problems with Leviticus, and most people do, but they start off reading Genesis, they're okay with that, and then they get to, to Exodus because both of those are kind of interesting. But if people are reading through the Bible, the, um, the drop-off rate um, it really picks up when it comes to the book of Leviticus. But read Hebrews at the same time, and you'll see a lovely parallel. Um, there's so much in Leviticus that can teach us about the cross of Christ, his person and his work. Um, we, um, if, if we're not consciously Christocentric in the reading of, the, of all of the Bible, then our teaching and our understanding of the Bible is going to be just moralistic or moralism. And so much preaching is just moralism for example i'm getting back to the uh, story of david and goliath what's the big point of david and goliath is it david is it david's courage 
and that we should be courageous like him, like David, in facing the big giants in our lives. No, the Holy Spirit's intent for that text is clearly God's trustworthiness. He fights the battles. David's victory was supernatural. He hit him in the one place where he's vulnerable, with one stone. David was a good shot. He wasn't that good a shot. So the issue is trusting in Jesus. Um, that's the main point. Okay. So once you grasp the overall outline of the Bible and see that it is a progressive revelation, we will always look to see how the New Testament interprets the Old Testament. For instance, God promised Abraham a seed which would bring a blessing to all nations, and the New Testament interprets that seed as Christ in Galatians 3.16. It's really awesome to see how the New Testament uses the Old Testament and how many times it quotes the Old Testament and it's so uh, incredible how Christocentric the uh, their hermeneutical use and understanding of the Old Testament was. 11. Just use common sense, critical thinking, or logic when it comes to making deductions or inferences when you're reading the Bible. The vast majority of our mistakes in interpretation, either by pastors in their sermons or by lay people, is a simple violation of some law of critical thinking or logic. And you don't I mean, I taught logic, and you don't have to be a logician, really. It all boils down to common sense. Um, do not infer, just don't infer from a text something that's not there. That's what logic in this sense really boils down to. Don't infer from the text something that's not there. And again, please, please take the time to read the superb article uh, below by Derek Radney, which in turn is actually a summary, excellent, succinct summary of the most common mistakes we make in interpreting the Bible. And they are often connected with word studies of Greek or Hebrew, but not always. So again, please read. And what he's done is he's basically summarized the contents of um, a couple of books that he had read. I'm try trying to remember the names of the fellows, and I'm having a brain drain at the moment. Donald Curse Carson being one, and uh, he's, a, he's a brilliant, godly man. He wrote a book called Exegetical Fallacies. Um, you know what, I'm... I guess the older I get, the less I quote Greek and Hebrew. Um, it's so easy to make mistakes um, because if folks appeal to the Greek or the Hebrew and they try to get back to the entomology of it, more often than not, it's going to be wrong because the entomology of the Greek, it changes. Um Sometimes it's right, but word studies can often lead people astray. And let me just, what I'm trying to do is just give you confidence in your, in your English Bible. Um, okay. So, 12. And this is shifting to application. How do we apply what we've read? This is what I do. Okay? I ask myself, what does the text say about God? Okay, I try to be theocentric. Then, what does it mean to me and my situation? What does God want me to believe? What does he want me to do? 
What does he want me to say? What is he teaching me to believe? What is What promise does he want me to embrace? What emotions does his text um, want me to elicit, to elicit for me? What warnings do I need to heed? What encouragement to take to heart? And so on. And I often think of um, George Mueller of Bristol, England, 150, 200 years ago, who, very godly man, who by faith took care of thousands of orphans. And there's two things that uh, I, uh, I think of often that I really like from from Mueller and that I remind myself of. And the first is that he, he said that he made it his first priority of the day to get his heart happy in the Lord. He made it his first priority of the day to get his heart happy in the Lord. That's a, that's a beautiful way to think of um, your devotion. Um, kind of gets away from the legalistic um, jive. And then he said, have you ever gotten frustrated with the gap between your knowledge and your practice and your, between the knowledge and your experience? Uh, welcome to the club every dang day for me. Um, or if you teach like I do, um, there is what's called the preacher's dilemma, always teaching above your own experience. But the key um, Mueller said, and he's right, the key to bridging the gap between the reading of the word and its internalization and its practice in our lives, our experience of it, is this. You ready? It's in the pondering of the text that we've read in the morning throughout the day. Okay? How often by lunchtime have we forgotten, I've forgotten where I've read? But Mueller is suggesting, and I agree with him, is that the key to really abiding in Christ, like it says in John 15, is to that whatever we've read is to ponder it, to chew on it throughout the day as a means of abiding in Christ. And that's what bridges the gap. And that is the key to walking intimately with the Lord which is what the whole reason for uh, God's in and out word being uh, interpreted correctly is meant to bring us to, and that is to walk intimately with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us your word that is clear, that it's understandable, and we pray that you might uh, bless these truths to our hearts and minds and that we might be motivated to have holy habits to read your word and to grow in our knowledge and our love of you for Jesus sake. Amen. Thank you. Turn this off.